all the other folks too late. Um, you can call me other folks who are coming in late. Uh, so this is just a little bit. Better. Coming back to what's next, so why are attributes better than 
the ad hoc mechanisms we had before. For one, they are sensible. Developers like us will write code and create new attributes. We can't change the language really. We can't add new keywords to the programming language. The attributes are available at one time. If I put some metadata into the comments, comments of course get lost in the compilation set. The attributes are really first class language elements, so I can use all the support that I get from the IDE, from the compiler, but also from the collection here in runtime on those attributes. That is not really easy with some of the other mechanisms. And lastly, it's really nice in the, uh, the net world, the attributes can also have program calls attached to them. So not only can I store the metadata, the information about the element that I'm annotating, but I can also directly feed the behavior that I want to execute with that same attribute. That saves me having multiple class hierarchies, a hierarchy of attributes, and another hierarchy of implementation. So clearly, they were a really good idea. And then, people started using them almost everywhere. So we had, if you, if you do unit testing, you probably know that in the next you generally do the test attributes or miles of the method of the test, or you can say something like browsable, if it's successful browsable is true, you can tell the framework and you can do something with that language element. Sometimes, annotations are used for configuration or mapping. So you can say, use the soap document method here, which hints to the web services stack to do a certain thing with it. Or, this is a simple file that doesn't exist in your that framework, but something you could do, display name method. So for example, if you have a model object and you want to have a different label appear, it also generates a user interface. You display, whenever you display this, you can probably have a different name, use the name address. Similarly, you can just keep information as if to the developer. Assembly title, for example, is really useful for software developers to figure out what's going on in the larger IDE. You can have what I would call a point cut marker. So, when you do aspect or in programming, oftentimes you need more regular expressions that tell you when to act or what the point is where you want certain code to be executed. If you write your own little stuff in your framework that exists for it, you can probably use annotations and say requires protection. So, method and it's called, and there's required protection. Attribute on it, something else in the background will start to use infection, and then at the end it will stop it. There are examples in framework that can do these things. We have parameter class markers, I can say the max length of string or whatever should be 50. These are all nice information, you know what I mean? What you can do with the base language, you can say, I have a data field, I want to call it first name, and it's of the type string. If you know there's extra information, you know that must not be longer than 50 characters. For one reason or another. You can't really express this. You could probably create a new data type, you could write a subclass string, you could have string in length or something like this, that would then make sure that that doesn't happen. But a quicker way of doing it is describing that in attribute. And so on and so on. Interestingly, despite the fact that a lot of people were using sophisticated modeling, had very strong object oriented, -oriented domain models in the middle of their application. If very few people actually started to think that they could use annotations or attributes for that purpose. If you look at all of these, they are mostly to do, with the exception of that maybe, they are mostly to do with technical frameworks around these things, with, um, with information that is kind of pulled out by the framework. The annotations are defined by the framework. If you use them, the framework will provide a service to you. What we want to do with domain annotations is quite the opposite. So these annotations edit, are added to domain objects. You can add them to classes, to methods, or even arguments. The idea though is there's no point in, for example, adding them to private methods. If you're private to, to a method, what do you want to add? You're not really using that from outside your class. So the key idea we need is to add that to the domain object. Model of the business domain. And of course, because you're adding them there, they are concerned with the domain concept, which instantly means that the type for the attribute, for the annotation, that, that type is also defined in that same namespace. The annotation will not have a persistence framework namespace. It doesn't yeah, come in from a persistent framework. It really comes from your domain and is defined in there. And that is something 
we didn't invent them, we kind of stumbled across these annotations while we were designing our software. But we realized that once we see the final text of the domain annotation, they usually use multiple times. We go back to this example. Something like test or browser true or stop document message has one specific piece of software that works on these attributes. The unit testing framework, Visual Studio, Web Services stack. There's one of course, there's one part of your system that cares for this annotation. There's not multiple things that you make use of it. Because it's also defined in the framework that uses it. With the domain annotations, the domain attributes, what you generally find is because they express something that is inherent in the domain, there's a couple of other different parts of the application that can make use of it. And sometimes you might even be created before they use. Sometimes you realize while you're modeling together with the business people what the domain model should look like, you realize that there's more information. For example, the string 950. And you might just put that in there and say, we express some of the ideas that we know, but you don't yet have a use for it. Then later on, the office will start seeing that, that information is now really useful for me because it helps us use in the end. But I do realize it's all very abstract. It's not very easy to convey these ideas. What I think is, I'll probably better show you some code. What I've done is, actually, a colleague of mine has done that before. We worked on an, on an application that had to do with stock management and logistics. I can't show you the source code for that application because it was done for a client of ThoughtWorks who had a non disclosure agreement with those clients. But what we did is, we created an application called Leroy's Logics. That's just a demo application, it doesn't even run. But it encapsulates all the interesting concepts and hopefully illustrates how the main application actually works. But it is based on that real application. Many of the things are exactly the same as that application where we first, I would say, we first consciously use the main application. What I'll show you is, just to get started, I'll show you some attributes that have polymorphic implementation. But that was another interesting thing that we did on that project. More interesting though, I do want to talk about the domain annotations for the domain attributes, and I've picked two of them, I'll come back to them obviously, data classification, navigational hints, and you will see how these attributes are used across a handful of classes. How many of you use attributes in everyday coding? I mean, I mean, as in right or wrong, rather than just annotating elements. Okay, so that's probably quite good that we briefly look at it. This is a definition of the maximum length um, attribute that I showed you early on. You saw how that would be used. What you can see here is I'm saying this attribute can only target properties. And the net of course you can inherit from attributes. In this case, actually, we have a common base class validation attribute. The trick here is the validation attribute, all it really does is it defines one method called validate. And it will later on pass in the, um, the property that can validate from the input, the information about the property, and the object. So I go back to that. So that's what I'm doing here. And as many annotations, they have a custom constructor. And I'm storing the maximum length here, which is always a private field. And here I'm just overriding validate method. So you can see there's a lot of reflection code in here. I don't know about you, but I've generally found that that, that, that happens quite a bit. The moment you start using annotations, if you write generic code that uses it, you end up seeing a fair amount of reflection code. All I'm doing here now is I'm passing the property, I'm asking it for the get method, so I call the favorite get get method, method, and just call it with the object. I'm getting the length of the value, and if the length is too big, I'm going to The cool thing about this one is that it 
problems have different validations. For example, uniqueness. And I'm not. If I want to say, for example, that two user login can't be the same or can't have the same email address, and I just need to go to the list of all my domain objects. And for all my domain objects, I just need to make sure that each value, each other object, is unique. That nobody else has that same email address or that same login password. I'm fair with the implementation, but the trick here is I have the unique attribute here, which also extends validation attribute, and I can say, which last to look at, I'm implementing the same method here, validate. It's a bit more complicated, but it doesn't really matter. The trick here is we have two very, very simple attributes, but they all in or inherit a validation attribute. So I can Based on my code, when I'm trying to use these, I don't even care whether I'm taking the length, the uniqueness, or all sorts of other things. I can put these on my objects, on the main objects, and I can check lots of properties about them. So that's a simple start example. But now, we're getting to the real business. I need to briefly explain, I believe, the domain model that I'm talking about. What we're seeing here is this is an application that deals with logistics. It deals with transporting pieces from warehouse to warehouse. And it's not planning this. So in the, at the core here, I don't know whether you can read that, it's a plan transfer. It's a transfer that somebody has planned. Transfer is a relationship to the product. That is the product we are planning to transfer. It has a period. A period, in this case, a month and a year. So we are saying we want to, um, want to do 50 units of this product in May 2008. But we also need to say from where we want to transfer it and to where. So the plan transfer has the origin and destination warehouse. But we now say, I'm planning to transfer the quantity, this product, in that time period from this warehouse to that warehouse. Additionally, we hold the information about the warehouses, in what region they are, and in what region of what country those warehouses are located. And then the last piece of the puzzle here is the transfer object itself. So a month later, when the reconciliation or the reporting is done, somebody says, that was the plan transfer, but what we have done is, on that specific day, we've actually picked up the, um, the goods that need to be shipped and picked up that quantity that might have been different. Right? Make sense? That's, that's the, all the main part of the domain model. And there's a little bit of additional domain model. We have users, and these are the people who use that system. They are associated with a country. And those users can have a role. So I can have a global administrator. The global administrator really, what his role is to change the reference data. They can add new countries, they can add new users to the system, they can assign roles to them. I have country administrators. These are people who are concerned with a specific country. They can only really change information that is pertaining to that country. So if a new warehouse is being built, the country administrator can create that new warehouse. And then of course, they are planners. And planners are the people who actually put in the plan transfers and associate all the data with each other and then at the end of the month put in the actual transfers that they have. That is modeled by those goals. Of course, in reality, all those objects are much bigger. They have much, much more properties, and I'm not showing them here because they don't really add anything to the example. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's important. Good. So one thing that we wanted to do was, if you look at this again, I don't know about you, but we felt that these, they all look the same, obviously, but they were slightly different. These things here are warehouse, and region, and country, and to certain extent product, are what many people call reference data or static data. This is data that changes only ever so often. It's not part of daily work that these things change. When countries do come into existence or cease to exist, they're very rare. And similarly with the warehouse, so that's more the data that is static to the people. Whereas these bits here, the transfers, the time transfers, the period, they are the real contextual data. This is the data that the system is really meant to handle. But there was something about this, and then of course we think about the users and the roles, and maybe audit records, there were also other types of data. What did we do? We 
guess it, what you guess it by now. We create some natural group. The data classification natural group. Couple of things here. You can see that the attribute is defined in the Evo storage model. It is defined in the model namespace because it really is part of the domain model. Nothing to do with the technical framework. I'm saying I put this attribute in the class, makes sense. I can make that distinction only at a class. I'm going to sketch it later, get a class that was not at a property level. And I'm a little bit of duration to find out here the best of a reference, protection, or a quality data, or configuration data. And then, as you can see here in the constructor, it's very straightforward code really. I can pass in the data classification. Classification is kept in a private field. Later on, I have a get property, read only property that allows me to get the data classification value. There's absolutely no magic in it. Very simple, something else will start. Of course, you start when you need to get this data out. Actually, let me show you. Yeah, but I'll come to that. So, how do I use it? You see it up here. On the warehouse, I'm saying the warehouse is silly reference data. So, we didn't expect anything else. If I went to transfer, we can see it is transactional data. That's how we use it. That's not what you meant. Yeah. That's how you apply it exactly. I'll keep it for one more second because I want to show you. How much little, how should I say, little helper methods can make your life much easier. So if I look at this, I often will, I often will probably have a class, a type, and I want to get the data classification for it. So I have a little method here to get data classification for a type. And you see here, I have a little generic method up here. Say get attribute, and I want the data classification attribute, and then I just use standard.net and reflection and one time code to actually get this back for me. But that means in my code, really, I don't have to worry about all the net configuration. I can just say, get me the data classification for a certain class. There are multiple different places I could have placed that code. This bit here, I could have worked as a test method, maybe even on the attribute itself, and then only to keep that. But the key idea really is. It's not that easy to get plain. It's not hard either, but it looks a bit ugly. You keep that code hidden somewhere where when you program with the annotation, you don't need to see it all the time. So, the first use was in the auditor. There was a rule, or there is, this application, that says that only reference data changes should be ordered. When somebody makes a change to transactional data, that doesn't need to be saved. Only for transactional data. That could be very different in your domain. In many other domains, you want to, especially before changes to transactional data. But in this one, we do. So there's a class called Auditor, which does all this. And I don't go into the details of this, but it just creates the audit records that gets the type of the modified object, and then it tests should I audit it? Should I create an audit record for it? And if I shouldn't, I'm just returning. And this is not the one. The key bit here is. The method down here in line 43 should audit. What I'm saying here is the same reflection helper that I showed you before, getting the data classification for the type, for the object that was passed in, and if that type is reference data, then I'm returning true. Because then I should actually create an order record. If the data classification value is anything else, don't create an order record. That means, as you can see here, what I like about this is that you can almost share with a business person. You, you see, like, that's our rule, that's the business rule. So the all of this, you have to kind of forget, close your eyes, close your stuff. But the general idea is should something be audited? If the classification is reference data, yes. So the idea is to have all that domain specific both quite concise and have the other bits move the way. That would be nice in itself, but I wouldn't be standing up here talking about it. The idea really is. We then realized there were other things we wanted to implement. Oops. 
Another rule was only local admins to change reference data. I come to the refinement of that rule. <laughs> the idea here is that if there's reference data, the planners should certainly not be able to change it. The planners can only change transactional data. Only the global administrators can reference data. So here we have a method in the permission checker class that says, can I change the object? Asks in the user that makes an attempt to change the object and the actual object that should be changed or is about to be changed. I'm using it. I'm using the same reflection helper, I'm getting the data classification point again. But rather than basing my business rule directly on the value of the attribute, here I'm using a classification in a switch statement, which means based on the classification, I'm choosing different rule sets. This sounds is extremely easy. I'm saying if it reference data, then if the user has the role of a global admin, I'm returning true. Otherwise, in this if it's reference data, they're not global assets, and we're going to call They're not allowed to change, obviously. And as I said, for gravity, we didn't come up with all the rules in this example. So here, and for everything else, they're allowed to, which is not correct. But you can see how the classification, you could say, if the classification is configuration, you can do other tests, say, you can only change the configuration that pertains to the user account, and so on, and so on. But the idea really is to use the same classification you use for both and your auditor, now in this permission checker, to set from different prospects, to select from different business rules. So more than one business rule relates back to the annotation. And the last one, I'm just going to stop this. But I didn't mention so far, this application was a smart client. So it was a rich client application, wind forms application at the time, that was able to work in offline mode. What that meant is when you started the application, you need to load a lot of data from the server onto the client so the users could work offline and they were not connected to the server. Of course, you didn't want to load the entire database into memory. So you had to be a little bit smarter about what we should load and also how much of the data we should load. Now, keep coming back to that loader. It's really a central class that uses even the other annotations as well. But if you come back here first, we want to make a decision on whether it should load something in the first place. Should I load this entity at all? If you think about it, the administrator would never change any transactional data. They're just there to administrate the system. Why would they need transactional data? They don't. So we have a business rule that says only load transactional data for the planner. Again, I'm getting my data classification with the section helper. If the classification is transactional, in that case, only return true when the user is sent. Otherwise, of course, it doesn't load the data. For all other classifications, again, for the sake of gravity, we're returning true here, say, all other types of data, this load the model in memory. What's interesting about this example is, what you could have done, how would you have done this without annotation, or without attributes? The public approach probably would have been putting static methods on the class, on every class, and but then you can't call it read. Because in a sharp, but the same with both true for Java, you can't make static methods part of an interface. So you probably would have done an instance method. And you would have said, um, that object that is about to be changed, you ask it what's your classification, and would have returned the classification and so on. It's a bit funny anyway, I don't like methods that don't depend on the state of the object and are not static, because that tells you something is wrong. If it doesn't change depending on the object, why is it not a static method? Can't make it static because it can't form an interface, and so on and so on. The other problem, of course, is to make the normal method is, in this case, in the should load method, we don't even have any instances. We're trying to figure out whether we should trace it in the first place. So we'll get an annotation that is attributed, or that is sorry, attributed that is annotated in class, really helps us here. We can make that decision before we even go into Figuring out whether to create an object in the first place. Okay. That was one area, but I think you saw how the data classification idea works, how it was defined in the domain, and how three different examples the audit, the loader, and the permission checker all use the, um, this same annotation in many different ways to express business rules in a very concise way. Again, 
I don't know, it depends on what the business analysts are like, but if you write tools like this, there's a fair chance that they can glance over, they can read it, they can never write it, but that's not the purpose, but there's a chance that they can actually read this and help you understand whether you've done the right thing. A totally different one, uh, what we call the navigational hints. I'll show you first what it looks like. Nothing at all. That's all annotation. So this is the country specification emphasis. You can see I put it on properties. It doesn't have any value. It just marks property. Why do I need those? If I go back. We realized fairly early on that when we looked at this domain model, that there would be a good few business requirements that made it necessary to associate a variety of these objects with a certain country. Of course, this is obvious. This region is in that country. I don't need to do anything really. But if you think about it, there's indirect relationships, obviously, in this. So a warehouse, obviously, is also in a country because it's in a region in a country. They can go all the way to the transfer. The transfer is related to a country because it's related to a plan transfer. The plan transfer is related to the warehouse and so on. So what we wanted, we wanted a good way of figuring out which country this transfer was belonging to. How would you form that without the country specification emphasis? So no. Maybe you would have written a method in transfer that would have said return plan transfer or country. Plan transfer or country would have had a method for country which said return warehouse or country and so on. A lot of legwork for you to do. Another option that we considered well, if you think about this, this is just a dependency map. These are nodes with the edges in between. And if you know what the target type is in the country, you could, from any point in here, do a normal web search. I would do first, or web first, then you would probably start caching something because it would, it would take too long to figure out the main model. We considered that, and then we discovered it would never work anyway because of this original destination. What is the country for the plan transfer? Do I follow this link or that link? Because the warehouses of origin and destination could be in different countries. So that wouldn't work either, anyway. As it turns out, we need to follow the origin line. So what we did is, we simply created that attribute that I showed you, and did this. So, in the warehouse, we are saying, if you want to find out what the country is, actually get the region. And then of course in the region, you can check and just open this. I guess by now, if I showed you the transfer, transfer class, you would find that current specification says postal plan transfer. So how do I use this? This is the unit expectation for the part time, but it gives you an idea of how you can use the part time. So I'm creating a warehouse here. I have a warehouse. This model set down and this creates a couple of domain objects around it, default settings. And now I'll tell the finder, get the target objects of the warehouse, and it will return a result with the country. So this part finder is, has a little bit of reflective code that is able to follow the property. What it does pretty much is it goes over all the properties of the lines on it as a country specification attribute, then use reflection to get the value, and then repeat until it actually hits the object of the type of plant in there. What we did, actually I'll show you the code right now. What we did in there is we used a little bit of convention. Because I'm saying I want to find the country object. How does the part finder know which attribute to follow? We just said take the name and add the specification attribute to the end. It's a nice little convention. Rather than having a configuration file or something which is clever or fast it is, right? But the specification actually at the end are the right thing. And you can see here in the test, warehouse region country should be the same because it should have followed that path. That's the unit test. I make this quick, I promise. Two technicals. So you can see that is the implementation of the path finder. And you can see up here when I'm initializing it, it knows what it is. It's a generic class. You're passing in the type here. And it just has this convention that looks it up in this model, 
puts the name of the type country in here and appends specification attributes, tries to look up that type and find it fails out, otherwise remembers what the actual type is. When I'm saying get path, actually it's not what I wanted, get target object is what we just saw. We pass in the object if the object is of the right type, I'm returning it. And otherwise, I'm having another method on my reflection helper. Get me the property with the attribute. And I'm saying, get me the value for the property, and I'm referring to the polymer set. That is just simply traversing that graph. Quite simple way. And you can actually see, in this case, how a lot of the features like generics that are not used very much can make the code actually simple. I mean, I know that generics have got a lot of criticism for like double and triple and pointing brackets at the end for using them. But it does, like this is actually quite nice. And it also allows you to make these tasks here and return types. You don't have to have the task in the user code. You only have the complexity in one place here. Right. So much about this. I think it's quite clear from these kinds of specification as they work, what the code behind it is. And now back to your question again. How do we use those? There was this rule that I mentioned earlier on that only global admins can change reference rates. That was only half the rule. The other rule, of course, is that country administrators can change the country, for, can change the data for their country, but not for other countries. But they are where it comes from. I can try this on any old object. If that object matches the user's country, then the user is allowed to change it. If not, he's not. How does this find country method look like? All the magic is gone. I've shown you the pathfinder already. All I'm doing now here is I'm getting a new pathfinder for the country and I'm saying, get me the target for that object, and that's the number. Behind the scenes now, in all those rules, whatever object from the domain model, whatever object I'm passing in here, the pathfinder says, I need to look for a country, and it starts here, which looks higher. That comes from the attribute from region, let's go here. Here, the attribute is from region, let's go here, on region from country. Ah, and the country is done, return the option. Very, very simple, very straightforward. Now, the next one is slightly trickier. As I mentioned before, this is a smart client application, and we don't want to show data in memory that we don't need later on. So, for example, if you are a planner that is based in today's France, you don't need to get all the data and memory from somewhere in Italy because you're not planning for Italy anyway. So, what we want you to do is rather than finding out something about object based memory already, traversing to find different objects, what we want you to do is we want you to narrow the amount of data we're loading into memory. So, somewhere in our persistence layer, what we want you to say is if you are loading data, and the user that's loading, that's currently logged into the system that is running the client, and he's he's in France, he's only loads France data, don't load Italy data. So what we needed to do is that pretty much for every entity we're loading, we had to put a clause at the end of the query. We had to say, if, if we had written SQL by hand, we would have said something where, and then we'd have to create a couple of nasty joins to do this, but in the end, where the uh, then the name of the country equals whatever the name um, becomes the name of the user was. Make sense? And here we needed to get actually information about the path itself. So, how do we do that? There are the methods that are scrolled over. There's a method in here, this is still the path finder class, which is called get path, which becomes a string array. I can pass in any type. The reason I think the model is like this. And I can pass in any type, and for example, if I pass in transfer, it would return a string array that contains origin, region, country. Like the individual things that need to be followed. What do we do with this? So the loader class, again the one that uses the system they have to get the data out of the database. We already had a method in here that should load, but there's another method in here called create query. Ignore the period at the end of the moment. 
I'm just saying create a period for type, and this type again is the domain object that comes the for the warehouse, blah, 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 and I'm passing in the user. And it's highly abstract, whatever is underneath, but this is that's what it looks like. I have a query builder, something that can build queries for the database. And I'm saying, you need to build queries for this type. And this thing somehow knows that if I'm fetching it, they transfer what the table name is and how the trade is seen and so on. We don't care about the trade level. Now I'm saying, if the user has no global admin, because or if the user is not a global admin, that means I need to load all the data that is related to the user's country only. The global admin, of course, needs to load much more data. It needs to load all the data, all the data. But that guy just loads the sectional data. It's a different concern that it should load and it appears. Different dimension of the problem. What I'm doing here is I'm saying, get your task finder for country, get me the task, and I'm getting the string array, and then I'm saying, my query will append the condition to that task and the value it needs to be the user's country. Except I'll probably then do some analysis later on knowing how these properties actually map to SQL columns and actually know how to play join and so on and so on. And I can return my query. But that's the second use of the country specification. You might have wanted to bother with all the stuff here anyway, country specification. I mean, of course, we need to come to specification. There was something in there that we knew already. We knew that it would not be sufficient to only narrow down the data based on the country. Because there was just too much information in the system to load all of this up at startup time. And of course, the bulk of the data, as most systems, is actually in the contextual data around here, which is only loaded by the planners. But what we knew is that those planners are working. They only need data for three months. For the current month, for the coming month, for the previous one. Sometimes, that's what they normally do. That's the three months they're concerned about. And then sometimes, like once a week or so, they might go back and say, what was the volume last year? But you don't always need that. We exploit the So what we did is, we only know those three months of memory when they were offline, they could work with those. They try to go a year back. We say, sorry, the data is not available, please reconnect to the server. If they were on the server, we would do a lazy load and instantly catch their data back. What that means, though, is that we needed not only to narrow the data for loading in by the country, i.e., following a path out from the level to a country object, but we also want to narrow it down by the period. We needed to have a separate path that, of course, the warehouse, you can't get the warehouse the period. That's the point. So like here, it doesn't make sense in the, the common sense real world model either. But for those two, we need the real, of course, the real domain for many more objects. And the transfer is the plan transfer and here is the theory. With the infrastructure that I explained so far, with the country specification attribute, this guy here was very, very trivial, come up with this period specification attribute. This is actually copy paste for in all the bits, not here absolutely hating, so we copy pasted it and changed hundreds of here. Yeah. So we now have a period specification. And if you go to land transfer, we'll see. Oops, sorry, that's what I wanted. It was transfer. You can see that both my attributes. You can see that both my attributes are on the same property. The transfer has reference back to the plan to transfer, and if I want to find out the country or the period, both times are first and foremost the plan transfer. If on the other hand, then I go to the plan transfer, you'll see that. To get to the country, I have to go to the original warehouse. However, if you want to get to the period, I go to the period. Make sense? Cool. Adding this, we could now implement the business rules that I talked about. I want to narrow the data down not only by country, but also by the period that we want that data in from. So,
So my method down here is very clear in that we looked at before, which had the query builder, and unless this was a global admin, it would append this condition to my query. And now adding another one. And you can see how all those attributes are coming together now. I'm using my data classification again. Because this rule is only valid for reference type of transactional data. See, it's barely at the end of it. What I'm saying is, if the classification of the type that I'm about to load from the database, if that is transactional data, then I'm getting a task finder, same task finder used for the country, obviously, but for here again, it does the same thing as we saw before. It depends the classification attribute, so it now knows which attribute to follow. The task finder does exactly what it does up here. Just get task, get task, and I can just append that permission. I think what you can see in this example really is, if I take the reason box, This is actually fairly complicated code, or it does something fairly complicated. This has to do with loading data for a smart client and actually filtering the data down. And at the same time, I think that that code reads relatively clearly the expresses the intent that we had there very well. I don't have any of the data layer code leaking upwards. I don't have any of the um, of these business rules that say something you should go left and go back to this group. Textual data to that, and you can combine even the user roles with the classification data depending on how complex the rules are. But none of this actually leaks in the domain object either, because it's not really, this is part of the domain. These business rules are part of the business domain, but they're not really part of any of the objects. They're not part of country or region or where. It would be really awful to somewhere else. And you can also see how the same attribute related to the case, for example, here. Because we used to get a completely different purpose, even in conjunction with yet another annotation, which is actually used in time here. That's what it is. Do you have any questions about this? Or? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'll make that first thing. I know it's hard, I mean, it was a really complicated big project and it's even trimmed down, but I realized that it's not that easy to describe within 45 minutes. So I don't know if this actually could be problems or not, but what occurs to me is that uh, if you do the fact that there are annotations, essentially to some extent the fact that there is a certain path leading to country and uh, essentially an object which was two levels higher it seems to have been all the way across. Now, I don't know what impact it would have, but if there were properties, I would have said, you know, that might be pushing logic also, and it might be right. But I, I, I'm not sure of what impact it would have here. It's just something which occurs to me as something yeah. which could be. I know what you mean. I, I know what you get. There is no really good way around it. I mean, what you could do is, as I said, if it weren't for this awkward thing here, you could probably do a graph search, and then it would just be completely external. Unfortunately, you couldn't do it in that case. And also make the code simpler. And at the same time, it's not really outside the domain, right? I mean, there is still, when, when you talk to business people, they say that transfer, to them, that transfer does have a country. They have to buy that transfer is from France. They know that, so it's not too bad. But I know what you mean. But at least it is part of the domain. Any other questions? Why I can't? Around as well, if you want to see more of the details or anything. Otherwise, what I say is, if you want to know more about it, a little plug here. As you do know, work for thought works. And not too much. I'm making it exciting. But what we've done is we've written a book for software anthology. And there's I think 13, 12 or 13 essays in there. And one of them is one on domain annotation. There's all sorts of other things in there. There's something about the last mile, like getting the code that you print into production. There's something about 
pragmatic performance testing, all sorts of things that we've been part of in everyday projects, but the um, main application one is also in there. You can get that as a hub copy or you can download it as a PDF from the pragmatic programmers in order. The book is also available here at the point of the Thank you.